two plus years. I'm going to ask our friends and advocates to join us up here. Maria, are your, our, our friends going to join us over here? Okay, great. Come on over. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today for this important announcement about the state of Connecticut's response to the opioid and addiction crisis. Um, let me start by thanking the governor for his work in support and uh, the commissioners who work with all of us every single day to confront this crisis. And I want to thank the governor and his administration for keeping us safe and protecting public health during this pandemic and the COVID crisis. But we're reminded today that apart from the COVID pandemic, the worst public health crisis in America is the opioid and addiction crisis that has ravaged Connecticut and communities and states across the country. The addiction crisis claims almost 100,000 people per year across the country and in Connecticut, more than 1,000 lost souls every year, and that number keeps going up. That's 1,000 families in Connecticut every year wrecked by the scourge of addiction and prescription drug abuse and overdose. That's more than $10 billion in economic damage on an estimated annual basis here in Connecticut. There are three major drug distributors here in this uh, a country. Three huge companies, Amerisource, Bergen, Cardinal, and McKesson. And all of us have heard horror stories about pill mills and doctors who overprescribe opioids and pain medication, and communities that see, that see two, three, four, five, ten times more opioids than any one community could ever possibly use. Well, the distributors play a central role in this crisis because these three drug distributors distribute almost all the prescription medication that we use in this country. Also, Johnson & Johnson, a household name, um, hardly any of us will go through a day without using a Johnson & Johnson product, but Johnson & Johnson has been a lead manufacturer of material used in producing opioid pain medications and have themselves produced opioid medications in the past. And so I'm here to announce today that we have agreed to a settlement. Connecticut has agreed to settle all of its outstanding opioid claims against the three major drug distributors, Amerisource, Bergen, Cardinal, and McKesson, and Johnson & Johnson for a total multi-state settlement amount of $26 billion. Apart from tobacco, which is the largest ever settlement, this is the second largest cash settlement of any litigation in history, exceeded only by the tobacco settlement more than 20 years ago. Connecticut, for its share, will receive over $300 million over 18 years. Those payments will be spread out over those 18 years. They will be bigger in the beginning, um, some of the money, particularly from Johnson & Johnson, will be front-loaded. So Connecticut will see $26 million in each of the first three years, and then that number will go up and down by a few million dollars, depending on the year. This has been um, – well, let me also say that as part of this resolution, um, as part of the $26, million, $26 billion deal – sorry – 70% um, of the proceeds will go directly to states to be managed principally by our mental health and addiction professionals. Demas will play a central role in this, and we'll hear from the Commissioner uh, uh, Nancy Navarretta in a minute. 70% will go to the states. Another 15% will go directly to municipalities. So that, that was an important um, feature of this discussion. The municipalities were represented by their council. They were at the table. 
at all times, so cities and towns are part of this deal. And a, another 15 percent will be managed by the state um, for the benefit of um, victims, families, and municipalities broadly. Let me say it also includes provision for attorneys' fees, um, attorneys representing a lot of private plaintiffs and cities and towns who together combined for a total of more than 4,000 cases on, on these issues alone. And the 4,000 cases were managed in one court, a federal court in Cleveland, Ohio, by Judge Dan Polster in what's known as a multi-district litigation panel. And so that's why this case was so complicated. That's why it took so long to bring this to a resolution. Um, because you've got 4,000 cities and towns and private plaintiffs, 4,000 cases. You have 56 states, territories, and the district. Um, and, and everybody had lawyers. And it bringing so many parties together to resolve um, such a singular crisis facing all of us here in this country took the work of, of really everybody involved. And um, it's a real testament to the ability of the states, even in this polarized climate, to work together. Democrats, Republicans, working side by side to bring this together. together. The executive committee was evenly balanced between Democratic and Republican attorneys general. And to this day, we have demonstrated that the states can work together and to bring vital and needed help to our communities. I want to I want to thank our team. Um, first, I should thank the Deputy Attorney General Peggy Chapel, who's here for her leadership and for keeping an eye on me at all times. And then Special Counsel for Opioids Kim Massacott, who is now Judge Massacott. I want to thank her. She can't be here today because she's doing her other job. Uh, uh, Special Counsel for Opioids, Assistant Attorney General Matt Fitzsimmons, and also Assistant Attorney General Jeremy Perlman. We're joined also by Assistant Attorneys General Sarah Nadim and uh, Amory de Graffenwright, and Elen uh, former Assistant Attorney General Eleanor uh, Mullen, and uh, paralegal Samantha Klein is here. Am I missing anyone else from our team? A lot of other people have pitched in uh, to make this happen. Connecticut played a central role in the investigation of the distributors and in pulling this deal together. And that's why I invited Attorney General George Jepson to join us here today. Uh, when General Jepson was Attorney General, he was one of the, the key AGs on the Executive Committee leading the states together in our opioid and addiction work. But it was George who said we needed to focus on the distributors. So it's because of General Jepson and because of Connecticut that the states together focused on the distributors and really put our shoulder behind this work. Fast forward to October of 2019. Uh, you may know that a tentative resolution was announced a tentative settlement was announced by a handful of states at $18 billion. And then quickly, a number of states, including Connecticut, vocally said, we're not quite there yet. We think that the distributors can do better and Johnson & Johnson can do better. And because Connecticut pressed hard, uh, especially in that courtroom in Cleveland, we pushed this deal from 18 to $26 billion. Before I uh, turn it over to the Governor and, and Commissioner Navarretta, let me recognize the people who really matter in all of this. Um, I didn't know much about this crisis until we lost Mike Taylor in Darien. Mike Taylor uh, was a tennis player and uh, he went to Villanova. And he was actually a volunteer on my first campaign for the state legislature. Uh, Mike suffered a tennis injury in his shoulder and was prescribed opioids. 
and we lost him one dark day in Norwalk, Connecticut, after he was in recovery, but he relapsed and he died. And every year we celebrate Mike's life through an organization called Shatterproof. There's a cardboard boat race at Weed Beach and Darien, um, and it's a fun event because we want to recognize and honor the great young man that he was. I want to also thank um, Paige Niver, who's here today, who will speak about her experience and her daughter's experience. Um, I met with Paige and uh, her husband and their daughter. Um, her daughter was uh, in a bike accident when she was 14. And she got, you know, that, that now infamous bottle of opioid pain medication, too much pain medication for her injuries. And she fell into addiction. And as Paige will tell you, they went to hell and back. And um, I got to meet this courageous young woman. She's incredible. And despite tremendous hardship through her perseverance and sacrifice, she's doing pretty well today and um, looking for a job, as I understand it. And uh, we're really proud of her. We're proud of, of uh, the, the folks that Maria Skinner of the McCall Center have brought with us today who are also struggling with addiction and, and recovery. And to all of them, I, I want to say this. This is not the end of the road, because we recognize when you talk to anybody that's in recovery, that this is a, a, a lifelong challenge, right? And, and for them, every day is a new day. Every day is a new day of possibility, and every day is a new day of, of great risk to themselves and, and, and their families. And People like Paige's daughter and the people that are here today, they're inspiring um, to see them doing well and to overcome addiction really lifts all of us. But I think we also know that so many other people will try and they will try and despite their best efforts, they won't make it. So that's what this is about. It's not about the money, it's about walking side by side with these families, with the people that struggle, not just today, but for every day hereafter, and to do everything we can to stop people from falling into addiction and, and to be there for them. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for being here today, and I want to turn it over first to Paige Niver, who's going to share uh, what this means to her and her family. Hi. This is not my natural habitat, so I'm a little nervous and I don't have anything prepared, uh, but I feel I'm going to just speak from my heart. It is my daughter who was uh, involved in the bicycle accident at the age of 14. She was given copious amounts of uh, drugs, and she even told me at one time that she was probably having too many of these drugs and, and she didn't feel good about it, and I, I made a call to the doctor and I said, my daughter says she doesn't really like these drugs and she doesn't, maybe she's having too many of them and the doctor said, well, then you need to up her dose. And I was being a, what I thought to be a responsible mother and I was kind of raised to do what the doctor tells you, so I just kind of said, oh, yes, sir, I, I will up the dose and, and I did that. Um, and I did that and I did that. And it turns out that the day of the bicycle accident, was the last day I was going to see my daughter sober until she uh, was 20 years old. So um, when Attorney Tong said that families are wrecked, our family was wrecked. Um, and it, the great news is, is that she climbed a large mountain and she's put herself together and our family is no longer wrecked because of good treatment and uh, good medical care. And so the settlement to me means that so many people and families who are going through what my family went through, you know, addiction is treatable and it's preventable. You know, I mean, I, 
I'm naive and I didn't know that those pills would do that. Uh, now I know better. But after she had the problem, the only thing that, you know, her perseverance and good sound care made her where she is today. So I'm, I'm really glad that the money is going to go for people who are sick and still suffering um, because that treatment saved my daughter's life. You know, I did uh, watch my daughter die uh, a couple of times and she was fortunately brought back to life. And without good medical treatment, um, she probably wouldn't be here today. And so I, I really thank you a lot for that, for these uh, people. And I just met some of the other uh, people in recovery over there and you guys are rock stars and totally worth it. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Paige. Uh, Maria Skinner from the McCall Center. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Kutat Skinner. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm the CEO of McCall Center and Help Incorporated. And what we do is work hard on the prevention, intervention, and treatment side of this issue. And um, I think about the cost of the opioid epidemic. And that's certainly, you know, we're talking today about dollars, um, but I think as Paige just illustrated, um, the cost is so much broader and so much deeper than that. And so when we think about how to attach a dollar amount um, to the pain and suffering of this epidemic, that becomes a, a particular challenge. Um, and so how will that help? You know, because it can't mend a broken heart. And I, I have lost track of the number of tears that have been shed um, by me, um, by my colleagues, by our clients, and by parents and loved ones of people who have been lost to this disease. And it can't do that. Dollars can't do that. So what can it do? And I think it can do three things. Number one is accountability. We are sending a clear message today that it is not okay to prey on vulnerable people with messaging that promises an innocuous medication, and it's not. It is powerful, and we've seen that it can be deadly. And so this is a message to say that is not okay ever again. There is accountability today. Number two is that we are looking at a population that for far too long has been invisible, has been shrouded in shame and blame for their present circumstances. And that's why I'm so grateful to the attorneys general, Jepson and Tong, and to Governor Lamont and everybody else behind me that the clients, the people who we serve, the reason that I do what I do are here today. Um, and they are some of the bravest, strongest people I've ever had the privilege of knowing. And to see that people in power with a voice to say you need to be accountable are championing them and their journey is huge. And that happens today. And third is that dollars help an under-resourced system. Um, that effective prevention, because there is really good science behind, behind evidence-based prevention, and we are investing in our communities. We are investing in our schools. We are investing in our children and our families so that the wreckage that Paige talked about and the heartache that we, that we are seeing around us can be dissipated. It can be mitigated with good prevention, and recovery is possible, but there are really effective treatments. There's a long list of initiatives that every single person who sits in a seat like mine has, like shovel ready to go, if only we had the dollars to be able to do it. Today that changes. So this is a day that I am so grateful to see, and it's worth celebrating. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to I wanna bring up um, Demas Commissioner Nancy Navaretta, and, and like Maria, she's on the front lines of this crisis, and Demas will play a central role in administering these funds and getting help to the communities and families that need it. So, Nancy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here on behalf of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services today. 
Last year, as Attorney General Tong mentioned, um, we lost over 1,300 lives to the opioid epidemic. This is a crisis that had its roots in the overuse of prescription pain medication. In our department, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, we provide assistance to over 50,000 people struggling with substance use. Many of those folks have opiate use disorders. Now the crisis has evolved to an even more lethal level with the introduction of fentanyl and other synthetics into the illegal drug supply. So I want to thank Governor Lamont and Attorney General Tong for your advocacy. We must continue to work to end the stigma associated with addiction and encourage people to reach out for help with recovery from substance use. Prevention, evidence-based treatment, and support from others in recovery, others who have walked this walk, is very important. We know that works. We have hope for a future in which fear of judgment will not be a barrier to individuals and families accessing a pathway to recovery from any of our state's diverse communities. These resources will help us to amplify Connecticut's response toward eradicating the tragedy of unmitigated addiction and help us recover from the tragic losses our families and communities have faced. Thank you very much. Governor Lamar. Before I bring the governor up, uh, let me also add, um, it's in the press release, um, but this, this settlement includes very significant, very strict injunctive terms that we hope will go a long way to preventing this from ever happening again. And so everything from a central clearinghouse for regulators like the commissioners here um, and, and state attorneys general to monitor how pills are moving across the country um, to other measures that enable us to uh, take action against wrongdoers and prevent pill mills and doctors from overprescribing and to stop the flow of pills. Those are vital provisions of this settlement. And with that, let me ask our governor to join us. Governor Lamont. Thanks, General. Um, hearing these you know, stories of pain and anguish, it was all preventable. It was all preventable, and that's one of the reasons we're here. You know, if your daughter had suffered that injury, probably in any other country on this earth, they wouldn't have been prescribed those opioids. It's striking to me that uh, over 90 percent of the opioid overdoses and fatalities in this world happen in the United States of America. And uh, that's why we're holding these distributors accountable. Uh, that's why I, uh, I had gone off to um, General Jepson for taking the lead on this, wherever you went. <laughs> and, uh, General Tong for getting it over the finish line and what this means um, for a lot of folks. And um, frankly, to each and every one of you, you're the guys that did all this work and um, wherever the attorneys are and what that means. And I'll just tell you that um, it's going to mean a lot. Uh, it means a lot that this is a state that um, we see an addiction on the rise. Uh, we have seen uh, opioid-related fatalities go from 1,000 to 1,300 and creeping up again this year, uh, a lot of that related to isolation, a lot of that related to the stress in and around COVID. And uh, we've got to do a better job of prevention. And, um, you know, General Tong and his fellow attorneys are very clear, this money is going to go to uh, treatment and prevention. It's not going to be siphoned off. This money is going to go to... Uh, the recovery coaches who are right there in the emergency room, right there um, when some of these uh, folks are not sure how they're being treated, they know they have a friend, they know they have somebody who's been there before to be there with them. Uh, this money is going to go to the navigators who are, uh, you know, recovering themselves, and they know where these fentanyl pushers are, and they know how to head this off, and they know where they, the people that are, you know, getting sidelined know how to head them off. Um, these are the type of things that uh, Demas and our Department of Public Health are going to do with these monies to make sure that the pain some of you felt won't have to happen again. 
And again, this is um, why you have an attorney general's office. This is how you hold people accountable. This is how you make sure that what happened to them won't happen to their children or their brothers and sisters. And this is why it's an important day. And, um, you know, William, our job is to make sure this money is properly invested and makes a difference in people's lives. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, before we take questions, let me mention that Commissioner Siegel is here and Commissioner Gifford. Uh, and I want to thank you for your partnership and the work we have ahead of us. They're also here to help answer questions. So with that, does anybody have any questions? Was sure. the timing of the settlement announcement at all tied to the uh, trial that is currently going on with these shippers in West Virginia? There is urgency around not just West Virginia, but New York um, and also Ohio. I think there are other states with trial dates. Uh, New Mexico has a coming trial date, so does Washington. That always puts pressure on parties that are talking about a settlement as trial dates come and go. Um, one of the biggest milestones was Oklahoma's verdict a couple of years ago against Johnson & Johnson for $450 million. That was one state. And, you know, I think that obviously gave an incentive to these huge companies to come to the table. Um, and it also demonstrates why this multi-state process is so important, because if we don't do this together, then, you know, each state is on its own, and maybe a few states get a recovery before a company declares bankruptcy. And so this is a way for us all to come together and to get a resolution that works for every community across the country. Um there's going to be 15 percent is going to go to municipalities yes uh so that's roughly 45 million out of sure. out of, out of uh, yeah. connecticut share how will that money be distributed how many will all 169 towns and cities be eligible will only towns and cities that instituted legal actions be able to get uh, this money how's that who's going to get that money and how will so it be distributed? that's yet to be determined um, but we thought it was really important to make sure that uh, there was a clear and significant bucket of settlement proceeds that went to cities and towns. Um, and uh, their counsel, their lawyers have been at the table throughout this process. So we need to still figure that out. Um, I don't know, Matt Fitzsimmons, do you want to jump up here? Do you have any additional thoughts on that? Sure. Special counsel for opioids, Matt Fitzsimmons. Thank you. The, the way the way it's uh, currently planned to go is that cities and towns that sign on to the settlement share in at 15 percent, but either way, at least the 70 percent that's set aside specifically for abatement will go to every city and town. It's not designated for cities and towns only of certain sizes. Right. That, so that's an important yeah. point. Of the 70 million, I'm sorry, 70 percent, I keep saying million, I should say billion. Of the 70 uh, percent that's going to the state that will be distributed largely I think by Demas um, and and its sister agencies and and those will go into treatment and prevention programs across the states which are in our cities and towns and many of which are administered by cities and towns and so the cities and towns will take not only from the 15 percent but they're also entitled to the distribution of the funds from the 70 percent to the state. Okay, but it, it, cities and towns would have to have instituted legal action or will it be able to sign on to the settlement even if they didn't sue? So there's about 40 litigating subdivisions here in Connecticut, uh, a little more than that. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that question about whether they need to have sued. They don't need to, they don't need to have sued. The, the, that's the first group that obviously yeah. the defendants are concerned about. But then from there, the other ones that are concerned about signing on sort of go down by size and population sizes. Okay. And uh, the, the release also referenced something about a, I believe, a state, state advisory council of some sort that's going to be involved in uh, distributing a uh, recovery and remediation fund advisory council. Yes. Who is that? Who appoints them? Th that, the details are still to be determined, but that is what General Tom uh, had just mentioned, that will be, be largely headed by Demas. Um, but there are certain requirements as to who will be involved in that. There will be representatives uh, for, from across state government and the public to make sure that the funds are 
going towards abatement and not going to, to other uses. Including, including municipal officials. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what about um, providers of services? Uh, something like the call I think there will be members of the public on, on this council, and I would imagine that likely members would be providers. So there, there's a timeline for states to essentially uh, vote their agreement. I expect most states to join us. This has been the product of many, many, many meetings and calls and Zooms. Uh, and then there's a time period for cities and towns uh, to sign on. And then as soon as it's all brought together, I think that we expect um, payments to begin I, I, uh, after I, that. Yeah, I, I think uh, the way the timeline currently runs will end around January 2nd, and if all goes according to plan, the first payments hopefully in April of, of next year. So we're not anticipating any sort of actual change with this money until next year? I mean, it does take time to move a ship this big. Yeah. Uh, Davis, but could you talk a bit more about just what your priorities are for distributing the funds? As I've said all along, it's about it's about Paige and her daughter, and it's about victims, it's about treatment and prevention and lifelong recovery. And the injunctive terms um, go a long way to trying to stop this from happening again, and it gives regulators and public health professionals um, and and law enforcement like my office and like Commissioner Siegel's department, the ability to go after and stop wrongdoers. But I think, I, I, I think if we're honest about where the money should go, it should go to, to helping victims and families and stopping the creation of new victims and new families impacted by this. Would you want to add something? That's absolutely oh, okay. right. I mean, as, as, um, as Maria mentioned from a call, we know what works. We have evidence-based prevention methods that work. We have medication-assisted treatment that works. Um, we know that having a peer stand beside you who has been in recovery works, in fact. We just completed a, an evaluation where we showed that two points, you have a 2.6% less chance of um, dying from an overdose if you have a peer recovery coach that you might have met in an emergency department, for example, it reduces your chance of dying. So we will do whatever it takes to reduce the incidence of overdose deaths, get uh, naloxone, naloxone out there, for example, get fentanyl strips out there so that folks in harm reduction mode can test the drugs that they're using to make sure that it doesn't have fentanyl in it and they don't overdose and die. Thank you. So uh, you heard uh, Maria talk about how this sector um, of our public health work is chronically under-resourced. And, you know, a $26 million a year infusion is going to be a game changer for a lot of these families um, and people struggling in uh, treatment and prevention providers. Well, we're, we're still working all of that out. Today is the announcement of, of the settlement writ large. There are a lot of details to sort through, and um, how to administer uh, such a significant amount of money will take some time. At least one attorney general in West Virginia has signaled that they may not sign on to the settlement. Is there any chance that these, these defendants could back out of the settlement if not enough states sign on? There is a chance. I don't think it's a particularly high chance. I think it's a very low chance that the defendants will back out. Um, the defendants, uh, we've talked a little bit about accountability here today, and we get some measure of accountability and some justice. But I think if you ask families like Mike Taylor's family, who will never get their son back, there's never going to be enough justice and never enough accountability. And um, the defendants know that. They know that their exposure as the three essential major drug distributors in this country face 
incredible exposure um, from this crisis. And so they're highly incented to make this deal happen, which is why they came to the table and have been engaged in negotiations. And most states that I'm aware of are highly incented too, because we want to put money out on the street, frankly, for treatment and prevention as soon as we can. West Virginia is a special circumstance because West Virginia settled earlier with the distributors through a different process. So West Virginia is differently situated than most of us. Yes, sir. Hey, sorry, uh, at the same time that this settlement agreement has been announced, of course, there's uh, a great deal of uh, ongoing or pending litigation, including, of course, the state's uh, complaint and complaints against Purdue Pharma. Yeah. How would you compare or kind of the perspective responsibility slash culpability of these four companies as far as their role in the opioid crisis compared with others such as Purdue Pharma? I don't think you can compare them, but I think you can say the similarity is that the damage to Connecticut and Connecticut families is profound uh, from the addiction industry broadly. And I don't think it's productive to weigh which wrongdoer and whose misconduct is worse than the others. Let me say that um, the distributors bear a lot of responsibility, and, and that's why this number, frankly, is so big um, and is the second largest in history. Purdue bears singular responsibility, even though they're not the biggest. You know, by order of magnitude, whatever could be extracted from Purdue is much smaller than this. Um, but as I've said all along, as the home state attorney general, um, that means that I have a special obligation to be aggressive against Purdue. And Purdue, through OxyContin, had a singular role in starting this crisis, and um, they could have helped us stop it. But in, in, instead of trying to help us put the fire out, they poured gasoline on it. And that's why, although I'm agreeing to this settlement today with the distributors, um, the settlement proposal by the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma is woefully inadequate and unjust. And as I've said all along with respect to the Sacklers and Purdue, a bad deal is so much worse than no deal, given the scale of their misconduct and the damage that they've done. Clarifying question. You mentioned the three distributors that were part of the agreement that Connecticut was uh, agreeing to, but I know New York has along with their agreement, something from Johnson & Johnson. So I was wondering if in Connecticut's money, are we getting, is yeah. the state getting yeah. money so from this Johnson & Johnson four, as well? The four companies. We have the three distributors and J&J. &J. The reason why New York announced its settlement two weeks ago, roughly, is because New York had a trial date. And so New York was preparing to go to trial. Their settlement is part of this overall settlement. And New York is one of the executive committee states that we've been working with to broker this overall resolution. How flexible do you see these funds being used? I know that's still um, to be worked out, and I know a lot of people had mentioned treatment and prevention funds, but I know there are a lot of people in long-term recovery who might be dealing with things like behavioral health needs, health uh, needs that have stemmed from um, their uh, substance use disorder. And so, and we've, I think you have also talked about potential compensation to families and individuals who've been directly injured by the opioid um, crisis, and so I was wondering how flexible you see these funds being so used. So in Connecticut, we believe in science, and we believe in public health professionals, and, and I'm going to leave that to them to make those decisions about resource allocation. Suffice it to say, this money, uh, by the terms of the settlement agreement, is, is directed towards abatement. The word is abatement, abating the crisis. Um, and so it should not be used and will not be used to pave roads. Um, though that's important, and, and we have to find money to pave roads, um, the focus of this will be abatement, and that's what the money will be used for. Anybody else? Uh, Governor Lamont, could you comment on the rise of COVID cases and the state's current uh, mitigation efforts if a uh, mask mandate may return? On the COVID increase, um, 
Yeah, we've gone from half a percent to, you know, two percent, you know, over the last uh, few weeks. And uh, we're still one of the lowest in the country when it comes to infection. Uh, I think uh, Deirdre would tell you that probably the most important metric is hospitalizations, since um, uh, we're still sending many, many fewer folks to hospitals uh, than we certainly were um, just six months ago. We've had 2,000, now we've got probably 55 in the hospital. And that's, that's really key. What we're doing in terms of um, additional mitigation efforts, you know, right now we've, uh, the biggest change that we've got uh, coming over the next uh, six weeks is schools. We've been discussing that with superintendents. We've been discussing that with parents and teachers and have to make a determination there over the next uh, few weeks. And the mask mandate? In terms of the mask mandate, no anticipated changes when it comes to, uh, you know, what we have right now, which is uh, following the CDC guidelines, which is if you're um, unvaccinated and you're indoors, wear the mask. What Thank do you know about breakthrough cases when it comes to people who were vaccinated, getting in Connecticut, anything that we're seeing relative to that in our hospitals, you know about? Uh, I can start, and you may want to back me up, but uh, you know, 99 plus percent of the folks uh, who go into the hospital and suffer complications uh, were unvaccinated. It's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. If there are some very few breakthrough cases like you're talking about, very rarely do they suffer, um, you know, complications. Uh, the vaccines are incredibly effective and safe when it comes to preventing um, complications and fatalities. Talk to me a little bit about efforts to get the unvaccinated vaccinated. Do you think there needs to be more of an incentive like we're seeing in some other states, the, the lotteries, the drawings and such? Um, I can tell you what the biggest incentive was. I was talking to the governor of Arkansas the other day, and he said, uh, you know, maybe people are a little casual about uh, vaccinations in Arkansas. They're not so casual now because uh, they have an infection rate that's probably, uh, you know, 10 times our infection rate. And uh, let's face it, the Delta variant really targets those who are unvaccinated, and the more unvaccinated, the faster this spreads. If that's not enough of a, um, you know, incentive, I don't know what is. Governor, can you cl uh, clarify the... I wouldn't say conflicting, but sort of slightly overlapping sets of recommendations. One is what you just articulated. If you're indoors and you're not vaccinated, wear a mask. The other is if you're indoors in any type of a crowd where you suspect people are unvaccinated, you want to be wearing a mask. What's your guidance in respect to those two? I would call them overlapping uh, recommendations. The CDC said, look, if you're um, unvaccinated and indoors, wear the mask. Um, you know, between you and me, you know, I'm hoping you guys are all vaccinated because I'm not wearing a, a mask. And if you're in a big group and you can't keep a distance, you don't know who you're next to, my advice is wear the mask. Are you changing your recommendations this week as, in, in, as a result of the, the higher incidence of, of the illness? No, we're not changing anything this week. So what you just said is what you said last week. And, and, and so if I walk in, well, maybe I'm okay over here, but if I walk through those guys over there, they're all vaccinated. I get it. But in a crowd, you're not saying that's a time to wear a mask, or you are saying that? I'm saying if you're in a crowd, you can't keep your distance, and you don't know who you're around, it's probably a really good idea to wear uh, the mask. Um, look, am I doing this by a mandate? Am I doing this by fiat? Am I going to be enforcing this? Um, that's pretty tough to do, but um, we're pretty strict when it comes to wearing the mask indoors. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, General. Well done.